Okay, thank you, Bennett. Uh, so we're going to have uh, a session today uh, morning uh, discussing uh, some issues with regards to acute and uh, chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic fluid collections, uh, assessment of cysts in the pancreas, uh, and uh, getting a surgeon's perspective and uh, uh, having uh, some information on how to better access uh, the biliary tree during your CP. So we're excited to have our speakers and our panel this morning and uh, starting off will be uh, Dr. Ali Sederat, uh, our uh, newest recruit to our uh, interventional endoscopy faculty. Uh, Ali's a, a former uh, fellow in our uh, division and did his advanced fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about uh, chronic pancreatitis and managing complications. Ali? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Here's my disclosure slide. A lot of these slides are from uh, the ASG and the AGA, and I'm going to be referring to um, the uh, European guidelines, which uh, recently published uh, a paper about 2012 on the management of chronic pancreatitis, which I encourage you to look up uh, online. So as an overview, we're going to briefly touch on a little bit of background. We'll talk about what the complications are, but primarily uh, because we have some limited time, uh, focus on the endoscopic treatment of the complications of chronic pancreatitis. Um, a couple of things to, to, to keep in mind as we go forward. Um, recognize that chronic pancreatitis is a spectrum of disease. Um, it's something to be approached with your colleagues, surgeons, interventional radiologists, gastroenterologists, internists, together. It's not something that you necessarily want to tackle alone as an island. Um, selection of the patient's individualized approach is, is really important with these, these patients. No two patients are the same and the approach should be individualized, and we're going to fo focus again on the uh, endotherapy. So some working definitions. Um, uh, chronic pancreatitis is a permanent and irreversible damage to the pancreas of various causes. It's uh, characterized uh, uh, by a histology of a chronic inflammatory infiltrate uh, and fibrosis on the slide there. You see a calcification in a, a ductule. And uh, clinically, it's characterized by progressive loss of both exocrine and endocrine function, and uh, a spectrum of clinical uh, morphological and functional abnormalities that cause uh, uh, sometimes debilitating uh, consequences. Again, it's a spectrum of disease, and, and severe pancreatitis is a no-brainer. You know, calcifications are present or, or a markedly abnormal duct, and it's, it's relatively easy to diagnose. When there's minimal or mild change, uh, it's a little harder. Uh, and uh, when there's discordance from uh, structural or functional tests, it's a little harder to diagnose. And, it's important to kind of keep this in mind as you're deciding how to treat a patient. Am I really dealing with chronic pancreatitis or is it something else? And uh, when we talk about uh, therapy, surgical, medical, endoscopic, uh, a major distinction between small duct versus large duct disease should be kept in mind with a cutoff roughly of five to six millimeters of the main duct uh, in terms of what you select for therapy. So uh, the diagnosis, anytime you have a slide of how to diagnose something and there's this many tests on there, you know it's a hard diagnosis to make. Uh, and uh, there's structural tests, there's functional tests. We won't go into details, but the bottom line is there's not a gold standard. And uh, it's a clinical diagnosis. Some of the complications, uh, obviously there's lots. Pain is probably the most debilitating and, and what uh, most people are going to come uh, see you for. And it's complex, and it's not just that... Uh, uh, the pancreas is inflamed. It's uh, a complex interplay between the CNS and the viscera. There's obviously exocrine and endocrine uh, uh, issues. There's dysmotility that can mimic gastroparesis. Uh, local effects we'll talk about, specifically biliary obstruction. Uh, Dr. Watson is going to talk about some uh, fluid collections. There's unique bleeding complications that can be uh, lethal. And of course, malignancy should always be uh, uh, kept in the back of our minds anytime we deal with these uh, patients. Uh, a little bit of just the natural history as, as we talk about these. Uh, early in the course, patients have primarily pain, and as it burns out, so to speak, there's good natural history data that uh, the functional issues become more dominant and pain becomes uh, less dominant, though it doesn't uh, always necessarily disappear. Uh, so let's talk about the pain. So lots of causes of pain. Uh, there's direct neural inflammation, ischemia of the gland, fluid collections and pseudocysts, intraductal hypertension, local inflammation, uh, local organ duodenal CBD obstruction. Most of the endotherapy focuses on intraductal hypertension and uh, improving flow. We have to remember, however, that it's not just the pancreas in these patients that may be uh, a cause of uh, uh, abdominal pain. They, they're at uh, risk for other 
issues, and I would highlight especially uh, uh, narcotic-related uh, uh, pain syndromes. Something that uh, we may uh, talk about later with the, the functional disorders is chronic abdominal pain uh, in general and chronic pancreatitis in, in specific isn't necessarily a abdominal pain syndrome uh, in isolation. There's, as, as we're learning more and more, complex interactions between the viscera and the CNS and uh, chronic pain syndromes. And uh, you know, we all probably have, have heard of or seen a patient who's had a total pancreatectomy with an auto islet transplant and still has the same pain. Uh, and, and so I think that's fascinating and uh, makes it very challenging to deal with these patients. So let's start talking about endotherapy. So what we have available for us uh, is uh, an array of, of uh, interventions. Uh, there's usually a pancreatic sphincterotomy involved, various degrees of stricture stenting and, and dilation, stone removal, stone, stone destruction, and more often than not, a combined approach is taken. So in that uh, pancreatogram, you see a dilated duct. There's a stone in the, in the head, and there's a stone in the tail. Um, so the approach. Patient selection is the most important thing. Whenever you look at studies that are comparing different uh, uh, modalities, uh, looking at the population is important. What, how severe is their pancre pancreatitis? What is their ideology of their pancreatitis? Um, so that's something you should really kind of uh, keep, keep an eye on. Uh, the rationale, it's, it works, it's repeatable, it doesn't hinder surgery, it may predict response to surgery, and uh, if someone has significant cardiovascular comorbidities, isn't a good operative candidate, has significant comorbid portal hypertension, which is often comorbid, uh, it's, a, it's a good alternative. So this is from the uh, European guidelines, kind of summarized uh, uh, some, some long-term follow-up, and, and to, I, I've kind of put these numbers together, roughly 2,000 patients, roughly six years, about a quarter maybe go on to surgery, 15% over the follow-up still need some kind of endoscopic therapy, but significantly in these long-term series, and these are carefully selected patients, two-thirds of them are doing well without further treatment, and we should keep that in mind. So the approach to BD, PD strictures. In general, I think the most important thing if you're looking at a PD stricture, whether you see it on uh, an MRCP or a CT scan or an ERCP or an EUS, is, is it benign? And every time you look at it, ask yourself, is it benign? Um, there's a high risk of uh, occult uh, malignancies, both of uh, adenocarcinoma and, frankly, IPMN uh, masquerading as, a, as a chronic pancreatitis. So am amenable strictures, uh, they're focal in the head or the neck, uh, associated upstream dilation. If you have complex strictures, strictures that are associated with a high stone burden, side branch strictures, diffuse stricturing of the gland, or some other associated complications, you know, those may not be the best to, to attack. Uh, so the approach is usually pre-dilation, uh, either with a balloon or with a catheter-based uh, uh, tapered dilators. Uh, Raman has a, has a nice technique of screw dilating strictures and coring, uh, coring them out, which, which, is, which works. Uh, and then uh, stent placement. Some would uh, argue for multiple stent placements, similar to the approach for OLT strictures. And then uh, at some point, exchanging or adding stents over a period of a year. And, and typically, the conversation to have these patients is you can expect to have several procedures over the course of a year. This is not a one and done type of a deal. And at some point, you try without a stent, keeping in mind that a fluoroscopic resolution of stricture is not necessary for pain relief. And that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind when you deal with these patients. And then obviously, if their pain recurs, you either go back to endoscopy or refer to surgery as needed. Uh, in terms of what stents to select, uh, generally single versus multiple. Multiple may be better, uh, and there's at least one good series that addresses this. Uh, sizes range anywhere from 3 French to 11 and a half French, uh, with typically in the 5 to 7 French size being used. Uh, the stents are generally sized to the uh, uh, downstream uh, portion of the duct, the non-dilated area. Uh, there's a variety of stent designs. I prefer fl uh, single flanged single pigtail uh, stents, um, plastic, usually metal is, should be considered investigational and there's not much data about uh, its use. Uh, it's very important if you're gonna place a pancreas stent for whatever reason that you don't place it backwards. Um, and uh, if you do, especially if you decide to modify it by cutting off a flange, and uh, you know, these are tiny things that you may not uh, kind of see how it's being handed to you. If you load it backwards, uh, the likelihood is that it'll migrate inward and um, it'll be a little bit of a problem. Uh, so here's kind of the summary of the world literature, if you like, of strictures. The technical success is very high. The pain relief is somewhat less, but still uh, relatively high. Sustained relief in about two-thirds. The follow-up is very variable among studies, and I think that's very important to keep in mind when you read these studies. 
the complications, roughly 20%. Uh, that includes pancreatitis, stent migration, uh, uh, infection, and 1% mortality. So it's not uh, necessarily low-risk procedures, and we need to keep that in mind. So moving on to stones, and I've, and I've, you know, just to take a step back, separated stones and strictures and things like this, but you're usually dealing with all of these together at once, uh, and, and we should uh, realize that uh, combination therapy is usually necessary. So roughly a third to one half of patients have stones, but stones don't necessarily equal the cause of the pain. They, they may be an epiphenomenon, especially considering uh, some ideologies of, of the chronic pancreatitis. So some patients that have tropical fiber calculus disease, they tend to have larger stones, denser stones, uh, they're younger patients. Uh, these are the series that are coming out of India, for example, very high quality and impressive series. Uh, but they're different patients than we may deal with typically here. And any time you read a study, that's important to kind of uh, keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is PD stones uh, are not the same as dealing with CBD stones. Uh, they're more difficult to remove, less successful, and uh, worth associated higher complications. And uh, so I think the techniques are a little bit uh, more involved um, there. So the approach, you know, something that's in the head as opposed to in the tail is more amenable to removal. Uh, something that's uh, associated with some dilation. Extensive stone burden, stones that are here and are impacted, stones behind strictures, stones inside branches, uh, complex or long strictures that are gonna in inhibit your, your removal uh, or maybe things that uh, are, are more difficult or shouldn't be tackled endoscopically. Um, so the technique, usually a sphincterotomy that's big enough to pull the stone out, uh, stricture dilation, and some kind of lithotripsy is often attempted, especially for larger stones, uh, either mechanical, uh, 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 S-wall, or intraductal. Mechanical hasn't really been uh, touched on too much. I think people are hesitant of getting stuck with a stone because they're usually harder. Um, and then uh, removing with a balloon or a basket. I think a basket's better. Uh, for sweeping the pancreas duct because a balloon tends to often uh, kind of redirect fragments into the dilated side branches as you're sweeping and a basket, uh, you know, may be more effective at avoiding that. So just a, a few touch about s -wall. It's a extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, if you're not familiar. It's a, it's a technique of basically extracorporeal shockwave uh, directed at the pancreas. Uh, uh, it's available at a few centers. Usually there's some kind of interaction with the urology department to, uh, to uh, get this technique. Uh, it's, it's more available in spe specific centers and centers outside of this country. It has very high fragmentation rate. It's, it's usually combined with en endotherapy, but there's at least one good series uh, that uses it as monotherapy, and it's probably especially um, uh, effective in the absence of significant stricture burden. Um, it's not been directly compared to endoscopic lithotripsy, such as EHL or laser, laser lithotripsy, but I would consider that you know, in hands where you do have cholangioscopy or spyglass available, an alternative, uh, and we've had some success with that. Uh, in in a, a meta-analysis of about 600 patients, it was, it was relatively effective at both uh, pain relief and uh, duct clearance. So one thing to keep in mind if you're, if you're going to tackle these, there are some features, you know, if you're not sure if you can, if you can tackle a stone, uh, do I need s -wall? do I need to consider lithotripsy? These are some favorable features of a stone on pancreatogram or on an MRCP that you can look for that may suggest uh, you, you'll be okay with just standard, if you like, therapy without uh, lithotripsy. So just to summarize again some, some stone data, stone clearance in two-thirds to three-quarters. The clearance is higher when it's combined with uh, uh, S-wall. The uh, pain improvement is pretty impressive, 75 to 85 percent, and uh, sort of a mild to moderate rate of uh, complications, primarily pancreatitis. So what we're going to probably talk about on the panel at some point, and uh, so I'm going to preempt it, so I have a little bit of a, a bias, I'm sure, but uh, often it becomes a, a question of, I have someone with a severe disease, I think uh, it's amenable to some kind of a therapy, what do I do? Do I send them to a surgeon or an interventionalist? We have now two uh, randomized controlled trials um, published that favor surgery. We'll go through those a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, we have lots and lots and lots and lots of case series from different countries with lots of patients that show that there is uh, a benefit to endoscopy, and it's a good modality. Uh, and these are, again, kind of a theme here, carefully selected patients. Uh, and we have also case series and, and, and retrospective series that question the permanence of the surgical solution, specifically drainage and resection procedures. Um, I, in the back of my mind, usually I have an idea of a, a warranty of about five to seven years for like a, a Pusto or something like that. And I'd be curious what Dr. Hines 
uh, make comment on that. Uh, but I think the, the goal here is really, you know, when you sit down and talk to a patient, um, to present options and to present the risks and benefits of each and, and try to talk about their likelihood of success. You know, if they're going to go the endoscopy route, they need to understand that they're going to be your friend for at least a year uh, and have to follow up. And if they don't, or if, they're, if you don't think they're a good uh, candidate to follow up, maybe that person uh, isn't the best candidate for endoscopy. So this is the first uh, randomized controlled trial uh, in endoscopy in 2003. I don't know if it's DITE or DITE, I think it's uh, French. Uh, 72 patients, five years follow-up, and uh, in general, uh, uh, surgery group did better. But this was uh, criticized somewhat because the endoscopic group uh, was somewhat suboptimal. About half of the patients that were in the endoscopic group received a sphincterotomy only, essentially, which is you know, probably not adequate. Uh, secondly, uh, the surgery group in this uh, first RCT was primarily 80% uh, resection operations uh, as opposed to uh, drainage operations, which seems to be more of uh, the vogue now. Uh, so this was the second one, the follow-up to this, to try to uh, answer some of these criticisms in uh, the New England Journal in 2007. This got a lot of press. It was a small study. You know, 39 patients is not a lot. It was two years, but the pain scores did favor surgery. Uh, and uh, complete or partial uh, pain relief also favored surgery. And significantly, this study was stopped early because of an uh, initial, early, initial uh, uh, difference that favored the surgical group. Uh, however, this also has gotten, and actually when you, when you look this up on PubMed, it's really interesting. You have the reference in the abstract, and under it there's you know, six or seven or eight endoscopists that uh, just berate this paper. <laughs> Um, which, uh, you know, uh, is kind of interesting. But the, some of the criticism that come out of those editorials, small number, the patient selection, a lot of these had pretty high stone burden. And as we talked about, uh, a lot of stones makes it difficult uh, for endoscopy. Uh, a lot of these patients had advanced disease. A, a significant portion had exocrine and endocrine uh, uh, deficiency, which is a, is a surrogate for advanced disease. And their endoscopic approach, although more aggressive, they combined it with lithotripsy, they combined it with dilation, although the dilation was optional. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting, they, they placed a 10 French biliary stent as opposed to pancreatic stents, which, you know, although there's never been direct comparisons, if you're not familiar, the, the biliary stents are just a straight tube with flanges. Pancreas stents have side holes, and the pancreas, as we know, has side branches. And so, you know, the use of a large uh, French without side holes may, may have contributed somewhat to, uh, to, to, to that, uh, that outcome. And the stent duration exchange was not necessarily in line with what everyone practices. Um, somewhat, uh, uh, you know, moderate uh, duration and an exchange interval that uh, uh, seemed to be less aggressive than what some people would do. Uh, they actually followed up in 2011, uh, their, their cohort in, uh, in gastro, 31 of their patients were there. The endoscopy group had uh, a lot more additional treatment. And about half of the endoscopy group, which was about nine patients, went on to surgery. My, my argument there is going to be that half of them didn't go on to surgery, which I think is important to, to, to realize. The pain scores that they used, the Izbiki scores, uh, were no longer significantly different, uh, but the partial or, or complete uh, pain relief still favored surgery. There's some nerve-directed therapy that we can talk about. I think, um, you know, this is uh, something as, like, that can be offered, uh, primarily a block as opposed to a neurolysis. Uh, the outcomes are modest and I would say temporary, but uh, you know, if, if, if you have a desperate patient or if you maybe you want to give it a shot, uh, a block is, is maybe not a bad idea. Uh, so let's talk about the local effects, uh, and by that primarily I mean biliary obstruction, uh, a variety of causes here, inflammation, fibro fibrosis, pseudocyst, tumor. Um, and I'll take a stop here because I hear you shuffling, so I apologize, I kind of uh, shuffled uh, some of the slides because of time constraints. But uh, I put in a lot, no, nothing is new that's in uh, uh, the slides, but you have a lot of information in your syllabus regarding medical therapy, some trials, and some extra reading for you uh, on, your, uh, on your own uh, there. So uh, the presentation for biliary obstruction, cholestasis, and pain, it can happen in as, uh, up to a third of patients, which is significant. And uh, it can be complicated in about 10% with cholangitis and significantly uh, biliary cirrhosis, which in some series was actually reversible uh, with uh, surgical decompression. And the treatments there are either bypass or stenting. Um, so the indications are really symptomatic or uh, elevated LFTs, and you're concerned for progression into cirrhosis. Um, so when you're trying to decide about surgery or endoscopy, a uh, high stone or calcification burden in the head may predict failure of endoscopy. If someone has significant portal hypertensive comorbidities, surgery may be a, a, a bad option. 
their likelihood to follow up with endoscopy is very important. In those patients in these series, up to 7% died from biliary sepsis because they were lost to follow up, and that's important to realize. Uh, and if they previously failed endoscopic therapy. So your choice, you know, you, you have kind of, a, again, a, an array of things to pick. Single stents, multiple stents, again, uh, the approach is similar to OLT strictures, parallel stents, as many as you can fit over a period of time. Uh, and then a covered or, or, or uncovered, or partially covered stents. I would say that uncovered stents probably don't have a role uh, for uh, uh, benign biliary strictures. Uh, and uh, there's uh, some good data that multiple stents are probably better. Uh, and, you know, these are obviously carefully selected patients. But, you know, over a, what I would say a modest follow-up, they do relatively well. Um, there's some smaller studies looking at metal stents. They seem to do well. I think the take-home is that it's an option. Uh, you have to follow up and remember to take them out at some point. What that optimal time frame is is unclear, maybe on the order of three to six months. I had a patient that uh, uh, was referred to me uh, at the VA who had a metal stent placed in 2007. Uh, and eventually got a cholangitic abscess, and so now we're trying to figure out how to get rid of uh, that stent. So we'll probably do a, a stent and stent uh, technique to get that out. Um, duodenal obstruction, just kind of to touch on, you know, uh, duodenal stents don't work as well here. And you know, if they really have an obstruction, surgery is probably the way to go through gastrojejunostomy or, or combined with uh, a pancreatic resection. So malignancy, we really want to kind of uh, uh, talk about this. The risk is elevated three to 15 times increased. You know, the, the longer you have pancreatitis, the higher your risk. And uh, it's one of those things, kind of like HCC and cirrhosis. Whenever you have a chronic pancreatitis that, uh, patient that changes, you should think about cancer. And if only the EUS in a chronic pancreatitis patient was this easy, uh, it would be fantastic. You see a nice, well-defined hypocoic mass in the FNA. The problem is that uh, you have an abnormal gland with heterogeneity, calcifications that may be obscuring or shadowing. Uh, and so the U.S., uh, although the preferred test uh, is not perfect and uh, may miss things. So you have to have a high index of suspicion. Don't be afraid to repeat the U.S. Uh, or, or refer to a colleague. Uh, and uh, I think no one is ever going to fault you to, to look again for a cancer. Uh, and so kind of when do you want to suspect that is, is you know, basically that something changes uh, that was unexpected. Uh, and uh, we all kind of from, from our internal medicine training know about the association of depression and DVTs. Uh, but uh, any kind of a change you want to just kind of keep in the back of your mind is, is cancer present. Bleeding complications, uh, just very briefly I'll touch upon isolated gastric varices are classified as IGV-1s. Um, they often don't bleed, but when they do, it can be severe. And uh, the treatment uh, uh, is splenectomy, or if it's available to you, a glue injection or other tissue adhesive uh, uh, collection uh, uh, injection. So uh, I'm going to stop there and uh, uh, refer you to the syllabus for some other uh, uh, data. When, and, and if you have questions about medical therapy, uh, enzymes, things like this, we can certainly talk about that. But just some things to kind of take home as we, as we uh, uh, progress in our talks. Uh, chronic pancreatitis is a spectrum. It can be difficult to diagnose. Uh, emphasize multidisciplinary management. And uh, whenever you're evaluating a patient or a study, uh, your population or your selection of your patient really, really matters uh, in terms of your success. And uh, what you uh, uh, ultimately choose should be tailored to the specific patient. That's it. Thanks very much.